Good evening, everyone. Thanks for attending. This is Luke Grand speaking, Next Generation Coordinator from Practical Farmers of Iowa, bringing you the organic cucurbit production uh, farminar, the last of our winter farminar series. We get spring started on March 1st at the PFI office. I hope you all don't mind that. Hey, Melville. Uh, if you all want to check in in the chat box, let us know where you're coming from. Uh, it's a great way to get a little quick introduction from uh, for the speakers, just so they know who they're speaking with. And um, well, I'll just go through a few slides of introduction here. I am uh, very happy to, to thank uh, Farm Aid and the Beginning Farmer Rancher Development Program of the National Institute of Food and Agriculture for their support of this series and of Beginning Farmers. Without their support, this would not be possible to, uh, to present these to you all tonight. So we thank you, uh, we thank them, and we thank you all for attending. A little bit about Practical Farmers of Iowa. We are a great organization to, to know and to be members of. I encourage everyone who's attending to join PFI. You can join online. Uh, we are a members, uh, grassroots based, member, member based grassroots organization uh, in our 26th year. And we have all kinds of farmers in our network that are really great to know, like Glenn Drowns and Ben Saunders, the two speakers tonight. So we really thank you for uh, for taking a moment and joining Practical Farmers of Iowa if you're not already a member. And if you are a member or uh, live away from Iowa and feel like uh, a donation might be a more appropriate thing to do, we'd love your donation as well. Those are both available on our website, and you can just click that link right there and uh, contribute to uh, this great organization. Uh, I also wanted to mention that our archive library of all these farminars is available for free to uh, watch recordings of these, this series, uh, we have over 28 hours of recordings on that link. So if you're interested in checking out other things, other uh, recordings that we've done, definitely recommend doing that soon and recommending it to your friends as well. We are excited to bring you the Spring Farm in Our Series coming up uh, March 5th, 1st through April 5th. And then we have field days uh, running this summer through the fall and uh, very busy at the office planning uh, planning uh, research projects with farmers, uh, doing grant reporting, writing additional grants, seeking funds to deliver the programming that our members uh, want us to, to provide. So that's what we're doing. The farmer schedule coming up looks a little bit like this, a little bit of everything, but uh, uh, CS from CSAs to uh, gra uh, grass-based livestock, um, business management topics, uh, even brokering topics on how to sell other farmers goods. Um, really great series for you all wind up coming up Tuesdays, every Tuesday in March in the first week of April. We couldn't squeeze them all into March this year. We had to go into April. We, we want you all to attend those upcoming farminars and we thank you uh, we thank you for your support. In the question here, a lot of feedback coming over. okay. Let's uh, let's resolve that right now. Hey, Glenn and Ben, could you turn off your audio? Thank you. Okay, so what's probably happening? Is that any better? Is, do you all still hear feedback? Let me know. If, let me know if it's all clear. Although, how does that sound in Michigan? Did that did that fix it? Okay, great. So uh, Ben and Glenn, if we're going to have to probably adjust uh, your... I'm still cutting out. Oh, I'm sorry. It must be your internet connection. Um, uh, the Dunham internet, internet connection must be a little too slow. I'm sorry for that. Uh, so we're going to keep moving right along in, unless it's a problem for other folks. Okay. All fine. Okay, everybody else is doing well. I'm so sorry. Uh, that's one thing about farminars. They do require high-speed internet. So if you can uh, work with your neighbors and, and uh, you know, visit with each other uh, to try to share, share a high-speed connection, that might be the answer. I know a lot of people also are using their public libraries to tune in uh, that offer uh, high-speed internet uh, for free as well. Okay, so we are going to move along to the next, to this feature, uh, organic cucurbit production. 
with Glenn Drowns and Ben Saunders. And I wanted to just take one special, uh, say one special thanks tonight to Dr. Mark Gleason for his uh, great research um, that he's that he's doing, along with a lot of other great great researchers around the country on organic cucurbit production. And if you're interested in when what those researchers are up to, check out their link uh, right here, and I'll put it in the chat box. That's a great resource for checking out uh, what's going on around the country in organic cucurbit production. And I also want to mention one more thing is uh, if you all can see this uh, poll on the right side of the screen, go ahead and click uh, how many folks are watching with you tonight so we get a good count of how many people are, are experiencing this program. And uh, if others join in later, I'll be sure to leave that up so people can, can uh, adjust it as they, as they join in. So let's begin with Glenn. And I'll go ahead and I'll switch over the uh, document to your document. You can start with a brief introduction and uh, a little bit about your work with organic cucurbits. So, Glenn, you can turn on your. Who did we lose, Glenn? What's going on here? Don't see Glenn in the presenters. Ben, do you want to begin instead? Let's, let's start with Ben Saunders. Sure, that's fine, Luke. And then when we get Glenn back, um, we'll have him go next. <clears throat> Thank you, Ben, for... Oh, not a problem. I understand I'm not a tech-savvy person, so I understand that that goes... Can you hear me okay? All right. Well, thanks, Luke. That my name is Ben Saunders, and I'm the farm manager at Turtle Farm that we're located in Granger, Iowa. And our mission is to grow certified organic vegetables, fruits, and herbs to sell as a community-supported agriculture share to people interested in receiving wholesome, fresh, locally grown seasonal produce. Here on the left-hand side is a picture of Angela Tedesco that she owns the farm. And in her hand is an amazing late flat Dutch cabbage that that's one of our later fall season crops. And then that's me there on the right holding a uh, CSA share box for the week. Looks like in that week there is some daikon radishes and some peppers. And I believe there may be some collards in there. Uh, this upcoming year, 2011, will be our Angela's 16th season of having Turtle Farm. Uh, like I said, the owner is Angela Tedesco. And she has an MS degree in horticulture. I graduated from Iowa State University in 2006 and received a BS in horticulture with a fruit and vegetable emphasis. And that was how I first got introduced with, uh, with Angela, was through my experiences at Iowa State University. Uh, that first summer, I started working with Angela as part of the farm crew. And I just, I loved Turtle Farm. I loved the things Angela supported and what she was about. So I decided to stick around. And she was grateful enough to let me stick around that this upcoming season will be my fifth year working at the farm and this will be my second season as being the quote unquote farm manager. <clears throat> like I had said before our main market is through a community supported agriculture program. I've also tried to attend a farmers market in Polk City for a few times last season but as we all know it was not a year of surpluses and our main market is for a CSA program so that's our top priority is to get as much produce to the CSA program as we can. I've also sold produce to the Iowa Food, Food Cooperative and to a few restaurants in the Des Moines metro area. Here's some pictures I put together about the farm. Uh, in the top left corner is uh, we'll have a garlic digging party out with uh, all of our CSA members. Um, so they were all out working hard digging garlic and and having a pretty good time there. It's a lot of fun to get a chance to talk with a lot of CSA members and it's always nice when you have other people out there helping with your work. Uh, that box in the top right picture is another CSA box that in there we've got some daikon radishes and peppers and I believe in that one there was some purple potted pole beans 
uh, leeks, beets, potatoes, and I'm sure there's a couple other things in there that I'm forgetting about. On that bottom left-hand picture was just a picture of the farm, and also I've done research with Practical Farmers of Iowa this last season looking at different methods of controlling flea beetles in eggplant. So in this experiment, I'll talk about a little later too, but in this experiment we we're looking at using row covers and kaolin clay. Uh, bottom right hand picture, I just really liked it that a farm crew member brought it up to me, that radish split naturally in that way, and I just thought it was a really cool, cool picture that represents kind of something that we're about at the farm. Uh, these are some more pictures I put together uh, on the top left hand corner. That's kind of uh, our main winter squash that we grow. Um, starting with that orange pumpkin looking one at top at like 12 o'clock. That's a sunshine kabocha. Then over there at 1 o'clock would be a Dakota Desert, Desert Delicata. Uh, the next one is a Gill's Golden Pippin. That, those are some seed that we actually got from Glenn. Uh, then next is a Sweet Dumpling Delicata. Then there's an early butternut, butternut, and the next one over is just a weird off-type, oddball type of squash that came up that we're not really sure what that was. That maybe Glenn might be able to help us identify that one. Uh, the next one up is a spaghetti squash over there at like 11 o'clock, and then in the middle is a green kabocha type of winter squash. On that bottom picture there, that's my little pity picture of last year we got so much rains that the fl uh, farm had actually flooded there for a little while. And since we're certified organic and practice a crop rotation, unfortunately that was the season we were also in the lower area of the farm. Uh, that bigger picture on the right, there's myself and then Sue Forrester, a member of the farm crew. We're doing our little high school graduation pose picture there on an Amish pie pumpkin. Uh, some more pictures here. The top left picture there is our Brussels sprouts. That, that's something I've really enjoyed growing and it's amazing to see CSA members faces when they uh, see how Brussels sprouts actually grow. That uh, they come on a stalk and they're really surprised. That's how we would deliver them to the different drop sites we have. Just like that. So it was always really fun to get to see people's reactions when they saw, wow, this is what Brussels sprouts look like. Uh, the top right photo is a picture of some of the bounty that we've had at the farm. Uh, there's a lot of sweet dumpling, squash, winter squash in there, and spaghetti squash, and sunshine kabocha squash, and red peppers, and then the shaggy stuff in the back there is beets. Uh, the bottom left-hand corner is a picture of our farm crew that we have a little farm stand there at the farm too that we pack boxes in twice a week. And it can get awful crowded in there sometimes, so you got to get to really uh, like the people you're working with. So that was uh, it's always a fun experience to try and figure out the logistics of, of how to pack everything in tiny quarters. Uh, this picture on the bottom right is one also of the flea beetle research a little further along that I did with the Iowa State. All those white plants are actually supposed to look like that. That's uh, kaolin clay that was sprayed on them. and uh, it, it's awful hard to look down a row of vegetables, plants, and, and see a bunch of white plants out there and get used to that. But that was some really interesting research we did, and I hope to continue it. I've, I've moved on to the beginning farmer questions now, Luke. Um, should I go ahead and ask those? I see Glenn's back with us now. Thank you, Ben. I appreciate that. I uh, wanted to see if I could go to uh, go to Glenn's slideshow and then come back to your questions. So we'll just switch over, and Glenn will start uh, introducing himself. Okay, are we on? All right. Um, this is. Um, my first time at this, so bear with me here. I hope this comes through. Obviously, I've crashed already. Um, I, when I first moved to Iowa in the uh, mid-80s, I thought uh, growing cucurbits organically in Iowa would be impossible. I've since learned that it is not impossible. It just takes a lot of work. 
Um, not sure how we move on to these next slides because it's not working the way I'm used to doing it. I, okay. Uh, the questions you have to ask yourself uh, if you're going to do organic production is, uh, are you continuously planting in the same area? Are you surrounded by cornfields? Uh, the cornfield issue is the more cornfields that are around you, the more corn rootworm beetles or cucumber beetles you're going to have to deal with that's going to cause you more uh, planning on your part to how to deal with those influxes. I'm surrounded by seed cornfields in many years when they spray those seed cornfields aerially uh, that drives a lot of those beetles into my garden so you're going to have to plan accordingly. Can we go to the next slide? Okay. Uh, basic slides uh, thanks to Luke that we had on here because I've never thought taken pictures is uh, you've got striped cucumber beetles and you've got spotted cucumber beetles. The striped ones are by far the worst pest in the early part of the seasons and then the spotted ones which seem to have I call them the dirty mouths come on mid-season and spread your most most of your diseases, at least in this part of the state, in the east-central part of the state. Those are the ones that seem to carry more fusarium and other, and other bacterial wilts. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. Um, the way I control them here is, is looking for um, uh, the, the first hatch usually coincides with any volunteer uh, vine crops that come up or when the corn sprouts in the field usually late April, warm springs uh, to mid-May. Um, I've discovered over the years to control it with a trap crop, and that's either having some volunteers out there, and usually I put them all in a group to try to attract all the beetles to one area of my garden and my fields, and then use that as an area to, to spray. Um, the major hatch of both species occurs here in East Central, early to mid-July, usually sometime after um, after the uh, corn tasseling time after the 4th of July. And for any of that, I use Pyganic, which is certified organic as long as you inspect with your, uh, your inspector. And the IDALS is the ones that I use for that. If we go to the next slide, please. More pest problems. The squash bugs perhaps are the biggest issue for those of you who raise squash. Um, I've showed all three stages there. Uh, from egg uh, nymph to adult. If you're going to control them, you're going to have to uh, uh, control them in that larva nymph stage. Excuse me, I didn't use the larva incorrectly. Because uh, once they become adults, they're pretty resistant uh, to, to every sort of insecticide. Um, the question is, where can you able to find Pyganic? Um, I'm able, you can get it in pretty much any um, Supply stores, I'm, I'm, places like ENR, uh, you can order it from ENR. Uh, Fedco has it. I believe Johnny's Selected Seeds has it. Um, I know there's plenty of places out there. Um, you kind of have to check prices vary. I found that the 5.0, not the 1.4, works best, and you use a lot less, and it works works great that way. Next slide, please. Um, as I've already stated, this slide just sort of sums it up. They're the hardest to control, whether you use organic or non-organic. When I first moved to, to Iowa, um, I struggled trying to figure out a way to control them organically and went to all kinds of non-organic and just uh, did, did not have trouble or any success with those either. So um, the Pyganic works well for me if I catch them in that nymph stage when they're young and just freshly hatched and they, they don't usually one spray and that's all you have to worry about. Your biggest thing with controlling these guys is to get them before they get going, and that's control them the year before. You've got to be proactive and not reactive. Uh, the thing that worked for me best when I first moved here, I had so many of them, was I'd just make corn shocks in the fall, kind of look decorative, pile all my old damaged non-saleable fruit or non-usable fruit around the base, wait till you get a good hard freeze, and then go out there and you'll find that on the bases of all those squash, you will find um, gobs of squash bugs trying to winter over in that environment so they can find food and then I just torch those corn shocks and you get two for the, you know, you get rid of your garden residue and you get rid of your bugs at the same time. Next slide. Vine borers. I just got part of, because I got in late, of Ben's slides uh, where he had all those nice Maxima squashes, the kabochas. Those are the favorite of the vine borers. They, they will get into the people, prep, preferably the zucchinis, the summer squashes, those are fine targets. 
uh, sometimes into the spaghetti squash, acorns, but they love those bush squash and they love the maximus. It's a great slide, whoever took this one, uh, showing how they get inside the stem and just destroy it. Um, in the late 80s, early 90s, before I uh, was uh, getting things under control, I had these in such massive populations, I would take 30 to 40 out of a stem every three or four days because they just came back. You could see the moths out there in the afternoon more frequently than you would honeybees. They tend to, these moths tend to be active right after lunchtime. I always call them my afternoon insects. Between about one and about five in the afternoon is when they do their most damage, though they'll lay eggs any time of the day, but the female will go from, from plant to plant and likes to lay her eggs at the base, right at the root where it comes out of the, the stem comes out of the ground. And then the, the eggs hatch, tunnel into the side of the stem, and do their damage. Um, next slide, please. Um, easiest way to get rid of them is hand slicing. If you're doing a large scale, you just can't do that. So you've got to get rid of these guys in the fall. And it's taken me years. I still have some, but not like I used to have. And, the, and I'm not a big uh, supporter of, of fall tillage, but that's one way to get rid of them, is to expose those pupa into the the freezing thawing process during the winter and you can get rid of a lot of them. That helped me control in areas, I did some experiments between uh, not, um, not fall tilling and fall tilling and that has worked out much better. The other option is, I believe it's on the next slide, um, is to, uh, uh, got my slides out of order there, sorry, is to uh, do su summer squashes, to get rid of those summer squashes as soon as you start seeing them. Just plow them up and um, get rid of them at that point in time and don't let those insects uh, get a good start on you um, to deal with them in the fall. I've found that the, you know, there's a question up there, the chickens like the pupa and the bugs both, yes. They will, they will I, I like to turn my birds out, especially guinea hens. Um, they will, if you tilled up that ground, they will go through and they'll find those pupa and do a, one turkeys, all of them, the turkeys are a little destructive, but if you can rotate your patches, you will find that those will take care of a lot of your your larval uh, larval stages. Uh, biggest thing that I've learned over the years is to manage your organic and fertility level of your soil. You just can't do it otherwise to get these guys under control. Uh, watching your planting times. Um, use of row covers has helped with some things for me, especially in the melon area to keep the cucumber beetles off. And you kind of have to be a daily monitor. You can't plant your crop and come back and harvest it. You've got to watch and see what these guys are doing and what veg insects you're dealing with. And I spray as a last resort when all else fails. Um, next slide, please. Um, some planting strategies. Uh, plastic mulch or not, uh, row width and single seeds or groups. I like to use plastic mulch to plant them on. It bothers me on a large scale that keeps down some of the insect damage and, and provides some weed relief around the base of the plant because if you get a lot of a lot of um, buildup around the base of your plant, uh, especially like straw mulches um, and hay and things like that, they're great to keep down the weeds. But that's also where you'll find that squash bugs will just hibernate like crazy in there, not hibernate, but congregate in there and they've got a place to hide and they'll just run in there and then come out and cause a little tear in your garden. And the vine borer moths, it gives them uh, some security where their stem is not exposed to anything and so when they're laying those eggs, you have got you can have some issues there. Um, I'm definitely not opposed to using straw or, or uh, hay for mulch. You just have to be careful when you've got a lot of insect damage to, or insect problems to, to work on that. Um, I like to plant um, summer squash about six inches between plants, maybe a little greater, uh, but a lot of plants start out with about six inches just to keep the plants spaced so that they have a chance to develop a good, uh, strong plant base, which helps them anchor themselves against um, the vine borer moths. Because uh, if you've got a, a group of uh, squash all in one hill, like six, five or six plants in a hill, it creates a little bit of weaker base to the plant and it's easier for those vine borer moths to lay their eggs and they just kind of, the, the larva can destroy your whole crop without much trouble at all. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I already talked about this. Uh, plastic mulch can also help with some of your diseases if you've got uh, problems there, but most of that can be controlled with, um, with good uh, crop rotation. <clears throat> 
Next slide, please. There's the concentrations that I use. I like to put summer squash about a six inches with rows about six to eight feet apart. I like to run my small um, four foot wide uh, uh, rototiller attachment on my tractor between my rows as they're coming up. And school winter squash, I like to do about eight to 10 feet apart. If you're doing it for mass production like uh, Ben's Farm where you're doing a lot, of, a lot of squash, I've used a planter and planted them so that they're single seeded and that also can have its ad advantages. If you're doing just backyard home type stuff or small scale, you can still plant them in hills and I use the term hill from an old fashioned sense but I just mean a group of three to five seeds every, every five or six feet along in a row um, and that'll provide you a good density to keep for weed prevention also. Watermelons, I like to plant two or three seeds together at about every six feet in all directions, and that makes a solid mass of vines that helps keep down the weeds. Muskmelons, I kind of reduce that, and with cucumbers to about four feet apart um, in rows about um, six feet apart. Question is, water penetration with black mulch? No. I, I garden on straight sand, basically. I'm going to cover that at the end. I got my project at the end there. Um, and where you plant the plants, you have the hole and, or the seeds, and all of the water will run from the mulch right into that, and it actually concentrates. I'm able to grow some um, crops on ground that is basically straight sand, and it kind of concentrates all the water from all the area that the plastic covers into those individual holes and can get me through some really dry summers when all the cornfields around me can be burning up. My cucurbits are doing just fine because all the water is funneled into one particular area. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, person says they have sand on large rolling hills. I'm afraid of it washing down. Um, I farm on some pretty steep ground, and if you get a good plastic layer and lay the plastic, it will actually prevent more erosion than it causes. And um, I don't have any trouble with with what you're, if I'm understanding your question of it washing down, I don't have that problem at all. One of my patches is pretty good slope and that's actually, it shouldn't be farmed, but I can get some good watermelons and good melons off of it by by using plastic mulch, whereas if I just tilled a lot, I would have more problems. I like to, to till on my flatter ground, I like to till between the, the rows until the vines get to that rapid growth stage and then at that point in time uh, usually it hits for me when I, from an early June planting about the 10th or so of July and at that point in time you can the vines will start growing one to two feet a day and you get that last tilling in before rain and then the vines just take over and you do not have to worry about weeding at that point in time. You want a few weeds to grow up particularly those late late type weeds like for me that's lamb's quarters or uh, red root uh, amaranth, wild amaranth that provides a little bit of shade to prevent sun scald in, in melons. Next slide please. Um, I divided this presentation into two ways to fertilize. You can use the cover crop method or the manure method and the, the cover crop method that works for me and I've been experimenting with it for about 20 years is to plan about a year in advance of what I'm going where I'm going to plant what and then rotate my crops and not have cucurbits in the same spot two years in a row. And I have pretty good about a one in every three year rotation so that you can get, um, you know, it's, it's about three years between when a, any sort of squash, melon, or cucumber is in that area again. Um, I like to start out my, if I'm using the soil building by using cover crops, I like to start out with planting buckwheat in the spring. Around here I planted about the end of April, about the time of our last frost. Uh, it grows up and then uh, till it in about mid-July. Might even get a second crop in there or maybe I'll just till for a couple weeks depending on what it is just to keep the weed pressure down. And then I like to plant turnips about the last week in July, first week in August and leave them on the ground all winter and then till them up in the spring. And they, they do a wonderful job of, of enriching my, my sand and helping build some organic matter. And you get turnips that are you know, salad plate size, and when they rot over winter, it, it gives you some good, good um, organic material to work with the next spring. Next slide, please. 
Uh, fertilizer, manure method, I have a lot of poultry. And before I had a lot of poultry, I kind of had to deal otherwise. But this is um, manure, whether it's composted or not, is excellent for cucurbits. I do not certify our farm for selling organic produce. We certify it for organic seed. So I spread my manure in the spring, usually the last week in March, first part of April. And um, that makes a little difference. You cannot do that if you're trying to go for organic vegetable production. You'd have to spread it in the fall. Um, I not an expert on how to do it. I have a former student that has a manure spreader that comes over and spreads my manure for me. I like it just kind of what I'd say like a thin layer over the whole field. It's mixed uh, with uh, manure, it's mixed with straw. It's fairly rich, uh, but I have sand so it drains really fast. Um, I do about half strength where I'm going to have watermelons. I always tell Tim to you know cut it back in that particular area because watermelons you don't want too much fertilizer. But the thing that I've learned over the years is healthy, fast-growing plants will deter insects and fight off disease much, much easier. Um, the um, commercial dry fertilizers, when I use that term, I'm talking about um, chemically prepared fertilizers, not dried manures or any of those types of things. Um, the commercial dry fertilizers I'm referring to, you'd go to a co-op and buy um, and you know 16 16 16 or something like that I, I experimented my first few years on the farm because I didn't have enough manure I had serious differences you could see even though the plants would grow the health and the ability for the plants to fight off the disease was not nearly as as great um, questions up here is what size is your farm it's uh, 40 acres 23 is tillable and um, now all basically all 23 of it's into some sort of vegetable vegetable crop Next slide, please. Questions always exist about pollination. In fact, on the way home today, um, I stopped to get gas and the neighbor asked me if I had pollination problems because he doesn't see any honeybees anymore. And that's probably fairly true for around here. There's so many uh, chemical sprays sprayed that the honeybee population around here is, is virtually non-existent. When I moved to this farm in 1988, um, I had wild bees in some of the trees on the hills, and I had massive honeybees everywhere. Didn't even think about pollination. Now it's a few native bees, and um, you see very, very few honeybees. And the honeybee keepers that were in the area are no longer around. So uh, if you don't have good pollination, you're not going to have good harvest. But there are a lot of native bees out there, but you have to provide some uh, refuge for them I, uh, that they can get a regular supply to keep them around. And we, we've planted plots just on my sand hill of different uh, things like vetch and different other crops that they like. And I plant some other, uh, other there's some wild milkweeds and things that, are, that attract some of them that have kept them going. Um, question exists is does compost work as well as manure? Most certainly. I, I used to use compost when I had a smaller scale. I just don't have the man hours to make good compost like I used to and that that is the key there is compost and manure. Mine isn't just plain manure. It's really sort of composted sort of but not officially because it's not turned enough. But you want that organic matter in the soil. Uh, that's, that's the key thing. Um, Questions that have been asked me before are, well, cucumber beetles will eat and chew on flowers, and in low densities will not cause a pollination problem. The bee will find the flower and, and uh, deal with the pollen. But once they start feeding down in on the uh, fruiting parts, the pistil, or on the male parts, if they eat, they love to eat the pollen off the anthers on the male flowers, you're going to have start having problems with pollination. And that's where you need to have a higher concentration of bees if you're going to have any success at that point in time, because the bees are going to have to get there before the cucumber beetles do. So you really need to get your cucumber beetles under control before you get um, uh, your, your pollination going with bees. Next slide, please. Uh, I went through a, the next few slides are kind of summarize a few ways to maybe, uh, if you're doing farmer's market or produce stuff, I used to do that. I kind of switched to all seeds now, so I, I experimented um, uh, with this situation. Uh, organic production works best for summer squash, I discovered, if I stagger plantings uh, about one a month, uh, starting with transplants that I start about the middle of April, and I would set them out early to mid-May. Around here, our last theoretical frost is about the 25th of April. But it can freeze up to about, I've had frost about probably 8th of May. You kind of watch and see how the spring's going. 
set those plants out. Those are going to be the ones that are going to get hit the hardest in most years. And um, um, that you got to watch and, and deal with those. And then I'd make direct seeding about the time I'd plant the plants out. I would direct seed the uh, other ones from May and then I'd make another planting in mid-June and another one in July. And even some years I've made plantings as late as the 1st of August to get some real nice, fresh, young, tender zucchini and yellow summer squash for that farmer's market situation in, in October, and that's worked great. Um, as the plantings pass peak production, I would start and seeing, you start seeing a lot of insects move in, I would um, immediately till them up and plant in a cover crop of either uh, dwarf Essex rape or turnips. Um, question is, is there a best time to spray to protect pollinators? Never, ever spray until it gets late in the evening when your pollinators have all gone you know at that don't spray during the prime time of the morning or the day squash flowers the bees know that and they they're out there as the squash flowers will open in the early parts of the day uh, usually depending on the heat at night um, very early in the morning uh, when I used to do a gobs and gobs of hand pollination I'd start hand pollinating about six in the morning and bees will be out there before sunrise just as the sun's peeking up they're going to be at those flowers waiting for them to open so never spray in the morning I would always wait until the evening and usually would use a headlight and spray after dark um, and kind of know where your, your, your insect problems are going to be and that, that helped because the bee is your best friend you don't want to kill him and you want to spray when he's, his enemies or <laughs> things are going to eat his crops aren't around. Next, next slide please. Uh, if you've got a small amount you can cover them with row cover and that really helps um, row cover has become increasingly easier to obtain and, and it's not terribly pricey. I used it in some cases if you would put it on, say when you set those transplants out the first part of May and take it off, you know, two, three weeks later when your plants are starting to flower, you can roll it up and save it and I used it for five, six, seven, maybe eight years in a row. Uh, you have to take care of it but spreads your cost out and makes it somewhat effective if you're trying to be organic and, and uh, deal with the you know, uh, maintaining your, your farm's integrity. Cucumber beetles are attracted to the smell of germinating seed. Uh, they will come to that. There is, there's a scent given off by that, and they are attracted to that. So if you set out transplants, it reduces your cases. In fact, um, I went to setting out all transplants for all of the cucurbits that I raise, and at, at one point in time, I was raising over three or 400 varieties between squash melons and the um, uh, cucumbers and would set the transplants out uh, growing only maybe three or four hills of each and uh, when I started doing that I cut down on my losses considerably. Um, you can also work against the vine borers around here and now this is going to vary depending on what part of the state or the country you're in but around here the peak breeding time for uh, vine borers is about the 10th to the 30th of June so if you've got uh, early set plants, they're going to get hit hard. And in most cases, if you've got those out there, they'll leave your young seedlings that are just coming up alone, and you can avoid a lot of moth damage. Now, if you have nothing else for them out there other than the young seedlings at that point in time, you're going to lose some of your young ones at the same point in time. Next slide, please. Winter squash. Um, I'm a winter squash uh, aficionado. I like growing them all. My private collection probably has 700 varieties in it that I maintain for seed savers. Um, I don't get them all grown every year, obviously. I try to get them down to maybe growing 100, 150 different ones a year. And over the years, um, I've learned that there's really no advantage to planting them prior to June 1st in Iowa. Those early plantings will get most of your diseases, most of your pests, most of your problems, because if your plant starts getting eaten up by disease, uh, plants, by pests, you're going to end up getting some disease or problems with it. Um, I around here plant about between the 10th and the 20th of June. Um, that'll miss most of the prime vine borer breeding time. It'll you can have a trap uh, crop of uh, to get your cucumber beetles out earlier with summer squash. You're going to get rapid growth because that's when it's the warmest in Iowa, right about that time, and the plants will grow fast. Um, been very successful doing that and unless you're really shooting for some early winter squash market. And when we used to sell at the market, even though you'd have winter squash, nobody really thinks about winter squash when there's still watermelons being sold. They start thinking about winter squash when it starts getting a little brisk in the fall. 
And if you've got all your winter squash ripening from a May planting, they're going to be ripening around Labor Day, and not too many by the time you go to sell them in October, you're going to have lost a lot of them if you don't have them properly cured. So it really times your, your harvest right in about the time when you need people to get them, and then there you don't have the storage problems, and you don't have a lot of other issues. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, melons and cucumbers benefit the most from transplants and then row covers and removing the row covers once they start blooming. And when I say start blooming, you want them to bloom. The first few blossoms probably aren't going to set fruit anyhow, but let them get a, you know, two or three days of good blooming going, then remove your row covers. This group has the most trouble with bacterial wilt. Um, my collection includes some that should never be grown in Iowa. There's ones from the deserts of, of eastern, or excuse me, of uh, southwestern Asia, from, you know, the deserts of southwestern United States, ones that have been grown there that do not like Iowa's wet, humid summers. And these, um, I'm able to pull those off partly because of my sand and partly because of using row covers and other things. But some of those are very susceptible to welts. And once the cucumbers bite, I've discovered over the years, uh, you got about three weeks before those susceptible varieties will succumb. So if you can get them up, get them flowering, and get fruit on them, you can probably pull off some decent fruit before the plants die. If you let them be exposed from the time they're first germinating, you're probably never going to be very successful. Um, and that's just one of the things you have to work on some, depending upon your concentration and your desire. And most people will choose varieties that will do well for them, so that may not be an issue for too many people. Next slide, please. Um, questions always come up about squash bugs and vine borers. Those will predominantly stay with squash. If you get to a situation where these guys have moved on to your melons and your cucumbers, you have some real serious issues with um, both your plant and your soil health, or you're living, you, you've really got a, a bad mess. I mean, I remember when I first moved to this particular farm that had been pretty much chemically abused for a number of years, I fought uh, finding squash bugs moving to my melons, to my cucumbers, to my watermelons eventually when they destroyed all of the squash because the population was so high and the soil was so out of whack with, with help that um, it took me a few years to get that back under control. But they really, squash bugs and vine borers, won't bother your melons and cucumbers in most cases. In this group, it's the cucumber beetles that are the biggest threat. And they're the ones, usually about the time your, your melons and cucumbers are looking the greatest is when our little spotted cucumber beetle friend comes on the scene and causes trouble with its dirty little mouth going and contaminating all your, your plants. Uh, the key to getting these crops is having a good organic matter in your soil and fast growing plants. You don't want uh, plants that are um, slow growing and just hanging on there because those are the ones that the cucumber beetles are going are gonna to zap first. Next slide, please. Watermelons. Um, probably one of the easiest crops for me to grow here on my sand. Um, I rarely, even when I had bad years, um, that I have trouble with growing watermelon. Um, cucumber beetles about the only thing that bothers them. Occasionally squash bugs, if they've run out of everything else, you've got a high concentration, will go there. Uh, biggest thing to remember with watermelons is don't over fertilize and um, get them planted when the weather is warm. They don't like it cold. Um, Cucumber beetles will usually only bother them when they're first germinating. And at that point in time, from then on, usually you don't have to worry too much. Occasionally they'll get into the flowers. Um, not always, but sometimes if you've got a heavy, heavy infestation. It says, do you recommend trellising cucumbers? Uh, yes, that works great. If I have done that and used, uh, I go to a farm store, or uh, excuse me, a building supply store and get uh, concrete reinforcement panels. They usually run about $5 a piece. They're about four by eight, and I use metal fence posts, and you can run up and get um, get wonderful, straight, beautiful cucumbers. There's some varieties out there that do great on that. Um, you know, your, your longer type cucumbers will just be straight and perfect, and everybody will think that you, you've got something fabulous. Uh, why not over fertilize watermelons? Uh, watermelons, uh, the more fertilizer you put with higher nitrogen in watermelons, the more foliage you will get and the less fruit you will get. Um, you can literally have a situation where you have 
just the most healthiest foliage in the world that you think is going to produce you tons of melons, but that's all the watermelons will do is continue to just produce foliage and foliage and they'll produce flower and flower and the flowers are really set because the melt watermelons just like to grow. You don't want to starve the watermelon, but those of you who have um, heavier soils that don't lose the nutrients as fast as those of us who have sand will want to really watch your, your fertility level. Um, if you are, um, let's see, how can I put this? If you're grazing corn on the same ground as your watermelons, if you plant the corn and it has a nice rich green color the previous year, I would definitely not put any fertilizer on it to plant the watermelons the next year um, because that's plenty of carryover there, um, uh, especially in the nitrogen area. And um, you, want, you don't want the vines to go too rampant or you will have some issues with fruit set and then the fruit will rot uh, in many cases because the plant just wants to keep producing foliage. Remember, watermelons are native to the sub-Saharan region of Africa where they put down a long root to get water and fairly infertile soils. And so a little bit of a good thing may go take it the wrong way. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, when it comes to varieties, I'm probably not the person to ask because I grow hundreds and hundreds of them. And you have to decide based upon what your uh, pest problems are and what you're trying to market to. Um, in many cases, hybrids I don't think are cost effective if you're going to try to graze things organic until you get your organic practices down. Um, I'm not saying you can't raise them conventionally with lots of pesticides and, and issues like that, but I'm talking about true organic production. You are going to want to kind of limit your use of hybrids until you know as far as disease resistance and insect, I guess I shouldn't say disease, but as far as pest tolerance, I've not found any of the hybrids that just stand out there and say we're, you know, that they're to uh, tolerant to these pests. So if you're looking for uniformity and a concentrated harvest so that you have all of your zucchini or all your summer squash at one particular harvest date, um, hybrids are probably the way to go. If you're looking for a little bit more continu uh, continuous harvest where things aren't always necessarily ripe at the same time and within the row you'll have all kinds of maturity times, then the open pollinators, which are far cheaper, as far as seed production will get you some good good results as well. Um, you know, that's what you have to cater to what your market's going for and do some experimenting. Uh, I would not experiment with expensive hybrid seed and organic practices until I got my practices down. I'm not saying that you shouldn't grow the hybrids. I'm just saying you kind of want to balance your costs until you know what you're doing at that point in time. Next slide, please. I kind of made a summary sheet um, here of my experiences with the uh, 20, 27 summers of growing squash in Iowa of their tolerance to things, listing the species in order of their uh, the best tolerance to these particular insects to the least tolerance. If you have severe cucumber beetle problems, the mixed species, which I'll give some summaries of varieties here in a minute, is the most tolerant, then the moshadas, then the people, and least of all the maximums. Uh, when it comes to squash bugs, it kind of goes in the exact same order. When it goes to vine borers, the order switches just a little bit. The moshadas have a harder stem and are much t more tolerant to vine borers, then the mixtas, then the people, and then the maximums. If you notice, the maxima squash are on the bottom of the list for all of them. And partly is, if you are ever around squash, you will notice that they probably have the softest stem the easiest foliage, and if you actually, I have to confess, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of this. I've tasted all of their uh, flower parts, etc. when I'm hand pollinating because I tend to carry the flower part from one to the other in this, the uh, stem in my mouth. They have the, the, the nicest taste. They're the least bitter. They're the, the best squash. You can almost guarantee your best tasting squash is the one that the cucumber beetles and the squash bugs will go for. They seem to know for some reason they can sense the chemicals or whatever when they taste it. So um, maximums are the hardest to grow in Iowa. Uh, next slide, please. I'll give you some examples of some varieties. And they go. Maximum squashes are things like Hubbard squash, all of the Hubbards, the blue, the gray, the green, the warded, all of those. The Curie squash, the Kabocha squash, buttercup squash, Queensland blue, uh, the Cinderella pumpkin, which is the, actually Rouge Vif de Tomp, which is uh, very, very fragile for most places in Iowa as far as that goes. Um, 
but uh, other ones are like Jardale. I can think of a few others. There's lots of them there that you can you can find. Um, the mixed squashes are the Q shots, perhaps the least tasty of all of the group. Uh, most ornamental. Uh, we used to sell a lot of them at the farmers market. People weren't eating them; they were using them for decoration. There's some beautiful gold striped Q shots, Hopi Q shots, all these different colored ones that people would buy and put in their yard. Uh, most shot of squash are the butternuts. Uh, cheese pumpkins, Tahitian melon, those pretty much um, can just about handle their own in most cases as far as insect damage. Uh, you can you can do good with crop rotation here in Iowa. Those will do just fine without, without any maintenance. Um, the peepos are all your summer squash, your zucchinis, all of your acorns, your sweet dumplings, all of your typical jack-o'-lantern pumpkins and spaghetti squash. Uh, and within that group, there are varying degrees of tolerances. Uh, most of the neat zucchinis from Italy have terrible problems with pests here in America because they were bred in a climate in an environment that does not have to deal with those pests or diseases in, in Italy where it's a drier Mediterranean climate and no cucumber beetles. Excuse me. Um, they um, do not do as well here in, in the Midwest. There are acorn squashes that are very tolerant to pests we have one that we sell that uh, was bred in Connecticut that is very, very tolerant to uh, insect problems and is uh, the only problem with it is it's kind of a stripe. It, it looks like a sweet dumpling sort of squash and the people who are looking for the dark green acorns have trouble with that one. Uh, there are different degrees of resistance of pumpkins and spaghetti squash. In most cases they'll handle its own on things. Uh, next please. Quick overview, I'm about done here. A um, uh, farm was purchased in the fall of 1988. It consists of about 40 acres of sand and very deep sand. 23 acres are tillable, 17 of it are an L-shaped sand hill that dissects the property from uh, east to west with uh, along the, the L part, the bottom part of the L is along the northeast side. Uh, goes about a 50 foot climb in elevation and that's all sand on the top. The uh, farm had been very chemically abused from um, chemical agriculture, no-till, high pesticide use for many years before I purchased it. Um, predominant weeds at that point in time were sand burrs, horse nettle, um, some foxtail, but mainly uh, very difficult to control weeds and it was very heavily insect uh, controlled. Uh, next slide, please. Um, 1989 was my first year here. I started with two and a half acres. Most of it was cucurbits. Again, experimenting, I had limited manure that year and did trial plantings of one row with manure, one row with commercial fertilizer, because I, I am a scientist by training. Uh, I'm a science teacher, but I also have a degree in biology, a master's in biology, and I like to do experiments. So I experimented with commercial fertilizer in some rows and manure in others. Over the next 10 years, we conducted various planting strategies to figure out how to get things to work better. As the soil became healthier, our insect populations have decreased proportionally. Uh, there's been no commercial prepared, and when I say commercial, again, I'm talking about chemically commercial prepared dry fertilizer on the farm since the late 1990s when I stopped doing my experiments. And by the time we got to 2010, I'm, I'm proud to say that I only used an organic um, pesticide, the Pyganic, once. And I'm, I'm experimenting with trap crops now, and there's a crop called Tin de Gore that I hope to do more research on next year, that all the cucumber beetles congregated on that. And I did one spraying, and that was the one spray that we did. And that was it. Um, do you have any experience with disease? I lost all my cucumbers to downy mildew. Last summer, if you're, I'm assuming you're in Iowa, last summer was very, very wet. Um, that uh, there are resistant varieties out there. I'm guessing you probably have heavier soil, um, and that is a problem with the mildews. Um, the, uh, I had a little bit of trouble with some of that on certain varieties because I'm always doing trials uh, in 2009. Um, I'm in Michigan and on sandy soil. Okay. Ooh. Um, I would, I, my question is, when you had the, the cucumbers and melons, were they, where they could get lots of air movement around them, or did you have corn on each side of them, or something that would have, that would have trapped uh, air movement? Uh, because if you, if you get into a stagnant air pattern, you can have problems with, uh, with the mildews and the, and the uh, 
growing on the vine. Okay, we have another question. Can you comment on post-harvest foamy ooze on winter squash? I've seen that in some cases uh, around here. That's because of a, a little creature called a pickle worm that that uh, gets into the fruit and lays its eggs right on the surface of the squash, and then they start hatching and they causes the squash to decay underneath. There also can be some bacterial. Uh, harvest damage that can occur. I guess I'd have to see the squash and which is going on, but if you cut into it, many times if it's if it's what I'm thinking is, you'll find a little tiny worm larva that's kind of living underneath the skin of the squash. Okay. Um, I believe that's my last slide, so I tried mill stop, but it didn't work. Um, I'm not familiar with mill stop. I'll have to do some research on that. I have had so little problems with mildews yeah, that I've not um, I've not worked with them very much. I, I will do some research on that. You've got my curiosity up. Um, I'm be interested to know what variety sometime if you want to you want to email me I think you could be able to find you know I'll see if I can check on some things to see if, if you said you lost them all was it just a couple varieties or whether it was particular varieties that are very susceptible to those things um, I would work on getting rid of my garden refuse in the fall and work on that I think that would help considerably if you could you know anytime you have a fungus if you can burn that fungus <laughs> you'll help kill some of those spores. Otherwise, those spores are going to be most likely there in your garden or your field next year. Thank you, Glenn. That was a really great introduction. I'm going to have to pause the questions from the audience uh, at the moment, and so we can go to Ben's questions. And then we'll, all, we'll still have time at the, at the end of the 90 minutes, uh, probably the last 20 minutes or so, for questions from the audience. So, Ben, I'll pick up your slides here. and. You can uh, get all your farm-specific questions answered. All right, great. Thanks, Glenn, for that great, uh, great presentation. That you've really got the wheels turning in my head right now. Um, I think you've kind of answered the first question. That so it really just matters having the cornfields around you because that's a place for the cucumber beetles to kind of, is it overwinter? Uh, if you have a lot of corn on corn, uh, as we've turned out to, especially with corn price the way they are, uh, you build up infestations of those. And so you, they, they hatch and then they come from your, they like corn root worms, but they also like squash or vine, you know, any of the vine crops. So they're going to move from those cornfields to their preferred food. I mean, they, the corn farmer calls it the corn rootworm beetle, and the, the, the pumpkin farmer calls it the cucumber beetle, etc. But those insects will prefer to come and feed on your vine crops if they have a choice. And so if there's a cornfield, if you've got corn all the way around your huge pumpkin patch, they're going to swarm from that cornfield where they're hatching to your property. And that's the kind of thing you have to, to think about in, when you're planting strategy. So. So I've heard that even around forested areas too, that they kind of they'll hang out in kind of the underbrush. Is that true as well? In your experience? Well, they'll hang out there, but I, they're not hatching from there. They're going to try to find one of their host crops. In my experience, to to lay their eggs and carry over their life cycle on. I mean, their their first choice is going to be the vine crops. Then they'll go to corn, and then after that, if they can't find anything, but what what's left in Iowa? You know, they, they're they're gonna they're gonna go there first, so okay. You know, a lot of times they will go to the forested areas because the they seem to flee when spraying happens. I I can almost watch uh, when my neighbors aerial spray their uh, seed corn fields. You can almost see the wave of cucumber beetles coming out of those fields. Um, you know, in, in the advance of the spray when they're aerial spraying. So. Okay, interesting. Well, then you had mentioned using row covers as a method of managing pests. Um, 
honestly one of the reasons why I was looking at Kale and Clay with the uh, PFI experiment was I'm just not very successful or adept at putting up row covers and having them stay up. So that was one of the reasons. <laughs> that was a uh, that was one of the inspirations for the Kale and Clay research. Um, since I had it on hand last season, I had also applied it to our first planting of summer squash and also on uh, cucumbers that I noticed a lot of the feeding on there. Have you had any experience using a product like that before? I have not. I have just read about it recently. I uh, wasn't sure where to even find it. I, I, I do correspond with a lady who does some research out at, at, at for Penn State, and she uh, gets a lot of seeds from us, and we experiment with resistant varieties versus using things like that. And she talked about she was having some fabulous success with that. But I wasn't sure where to even find it. Um, you know, the, the part about eggplant, yeah, that's a whole, I, if you can figure out how to control flea beetles on eggplant, you know, that, that is, is great. Because if that works for that, I would, I would like to see how it works on cucumber beetle feeding. Um, I, I, I'm curious how much you had to put on to see if it worked, because you get to a point, I'm th you know, flea beetle is a much smaller insect, and when you start getting into squash or squash plants, you're going to have to cover so much of it. What's that going to do to the photosynthesis, and does this stuff wash off? I guess I have all kinds of questions going through my head. Right, I'd only used it once the first first two leaves had appeared on the uh, summer okay. squash. Okay, okay. Yes, yes, and then I was just doing that. I agree with you 100% that healthy plants is probably one of the best pest management strategies you can have. So I was just trying to hope to give them an extra little boost. Yeah, there that would be experimenting, and I'm always looking for an experiment, so I, I may have to, to try and try that next summer on some sure. different things. Well, and at what stage of the plant's growth then would you stop tilling and hopefully expect the canopy of the crop to be able to shade out the weeds? Um, I look for that rapid growth phase. And for me, from a early June planting, that's usually somewhere after about the 4th of July, about 35, 40 days into it. Now, if you're planting back in May, you've got to add some because it doesn't grow as fast in May with our cooler temperatures. But when right. you look out there and you, you see... For watermelon, if any of you have grown watermelon, you know that they, they start out and they look scrawny, they look scrawny because they're initially putting down a huge root that's going way, way deep. And at that point in time, um, you know, they're not growing very fast. And then all of a sudden, you'll look at watermelons and they'll go from this thing that the plant may be the size of a dinner plate to where they've shot out uh, vines three to four feet in all directions. It's, it's kind of at that point when I see that rapid growth, I do my final tillage. And then I know that if things are going right, they're going to fill in the gaps between the rows and the weeds coming up at that point in time are just going to do minimal damage to my crop. They're, they're, not, they're going to destroy the aesthetics, but I think if we're going to do a sustainable, long-lasting system, we have to get rid of this idea that every field has to be 100% weed-free and look sterile in order to keep you know things going. Um, it, it's just... Um, you know, I know Iowa is, is prideful of its soybean fields that are weed-free and all of that from, from chemical usage, but I think a few weeds coming up, and I'm not talking a lot, a lot, but a few weeds coming up between the rows and squash will shade more if we get, uh, you know, a little bit of a drier summer and the leaves crumble or anything like that than the damage that they're going to cause when they're away from the plant like that. Now, plants within the row where the squash are actually growing, you need to keep the weeds down there, but if you've done that early, that those weeds that are coming out in the middle aren't going to do anything but help you as far as keeping your plants from getting, or your fruit from getting sun stalled. Okay, good. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. Um, I personally have no experience growing in hills as far as commercial production goes. I've done it, you know, in my home garden before, kind of a three sisters idea sometimes. Um, how far do you space the hills for winter squash within the row? Well, like I said, I use the term hill loosely. Where I grew up in Idaho, where we had a water shortage, I made, it would be more like called little cavities, and they would put a right. big kind of a basin out and plant about five to six seeds in each basin, about six feet in all directions. It worked good for me there. Uh, here in Iowa, I would increase that to about 10 feet between rows and about six feet within the row between those basins. But if, I, if I'm doing like, as I saw your slides, you're doing, when I used to do farmer's market stuff, I just used a row seeder and just distributed them that way down the row, and that works just fine. Um, you know, the thing, I've kind of gone to using some black plastic mulch for, because I just don't have the manpower to keep everything weeded. 
Um, I still plant like three to four plants, you know, every six feet in a row, and that works easier for me to maintain them. So I can just poke a little hole in the plastic and shove down uh, a group of three or four plants in one planting and be done with it. But uh, okay. Yeah, I was amazed when you talked about summer squash, uh, six inch spacing within the row for them. Normally in the past, you know, I've planted summer squash about three feet apart, two to three seeds within the row. Um, and the rows are about four to five feet apart. Do you think, well, what do you see as the benefits first to planting summer squash so closely? Or in, I, what I, I consider I, close. Okay, yeah, I, I agree with you on the close because I allow for a little bit of loss from different, you know, when they're young like that. So you're probably going to end up with them about a foot apart. Uh, I, I guess I was placing the seeds about every six inches. And then if they grow that way, uh, you can still do okay on some, but certain ones you may want to increase your distance as opposed to, uh, I guess the way I grew up, I always planted them in hills. So I had about six plants, three to six plants every, you know, two feet apart. And they were very dense, but I've gone to having them, you know, a little bit closer, I guess, as far as in a row, but not in a bunch like that. So, so yeah, we grow a Castata Romanesco, and I could easily okay. put that each apart that part and, yeah. and 10 feet yeah. between the rows, and it still probably That's wouldn't be enough. That, yeah. yeah. That one is a biggie. That's a biggie. Um, I'm thinking more along the lines of some of the, the zucchinis that most people are growing. I, I wasn't thinking that anybody would be growing something like that. But, yeah, you're going to have to put that one a little bit farther apart, um, definitely, because it gets such big, big stems on it um, uh, that it's got to have more space than that. Oh, it was amazing. And every year I forget how far it grows. Mm -hmm. that, um, so even with a foot apart with the summer squash, do you feel that's still enough spacing to get the most out of each plant? I, and I'm coming up from it from a commercial perspective. Yeah, you're coming at it from perspective. perspective. I guess I come at summer squash from them being a rather expendable crop, and I want a few prime. I don't look at them as a long-term thing. I take better care of my winter squash because I, the summer squash will be the ones that will get the most insect damage and have, suffer the most problems. And I, I look at getting two or three good pickings and then using that ground for something else because it, the longer you stretch the summer squash out, the more it seems that you will congregate a lot of your noxious little insects and the more chances they're going to get diseased and the more, the more disfigured the fruit are going to be toward the end of the season also. Um, so uh, when I was doing the farmer's market stuff, I just got to that point where I planted some fresh ones about every month and then I didn't mess with it. Um, that was my strategy. I'm not saying it's the right strategy to do. If you're going to plan on getting your best and, and, and maintaining those for a longer season, if you've got your, your insects and, and everything under control, then I definitely increase to about, you know, two feet between plants and give them more space. Um, that way they can, you know, fill in a little bit better. I, I just think of summer squash as kind of an expendable thing, and, and, and that's probably a bad attitude. I'm sorry. Sure. <laughs> sure. And I'll be the first to admit I still have a lot to learn on cover crops. That in a, Is there another type of cover crop I could use besides brassicas in the cover crop method you described? And the reasoning for that is we experienced a lot of black rot last season, and especially in our later fall crops, and I'm just afraid planting Are another brassica would it. spread it all over the place. But. Um, well, I'm a big lover of brassicas, and maybe it's, it's because of um, some research I'd read years ago before I moved to Iowa. I made the decision to move to Iowa because I wanted to experience some challenges in growing things other than short seasons where I grew up. And um, so I'd done a lot of reading about it, and they'd always talked about using radishes and things of that nature to help deter insects that, uh, around your, your uh, uh, cucurbits. And so I experimented with that and found it to not really work. They said plant radishes in the hill with your squash and all that. And it didn't seem to work for me my first couple of years. But what seems to have worked is, for me, is to plant them and till them up before I plant the, the, uh, the crop. I have never seen black rot in um, Essex rape or uh, turnips. The only time I ever had black rot on the farm was when I used to, one year I 
purchased a whole bunch of cabbage transplants from someplace down south because I, my greenhouse was not completed and I needed them for farmer's market purposes. And I had all these wonderful hybrid cabbages that were looking absolutely fantastic. And I had all of them in every row was identical and all ripening at the same time, or ready to harvest at the same time. And they all got black rot and they all died at the same time. So I understand your concern and that would, you're right, that would make fear for me to do another brassica. Um, buckwheat is a great crop. It attracts bees for one. It works as a good soil builder. You can, it tends to get away from you if you don't get it tilled up quick enough. Um, I've been experimenting a little bit uh, with using uh, legume crops, uh, field peas. I haven't got my, my, my technique down on that one yet, so I don't feel comfortable to talk about that one. There are some other uh, brassica relatives that I don't believe would spread black, black rot, excuse me, some of the mustards that would work quite well um, for tilling up also. Um, that, you know, is, is, is something that um, you could experiment with too. Buckwheat is pretty harmless. I don't think you're going to end up with any situations there um, that would cause you, you know, any more uh, black rot problems. So pretty much the reason for using Nebraska there is just for organic matter though. Yeah, and I'm going to say, I just scanned your slides sure. when you sent them to me yesterday and, and noticed you look like you have a very heavy soil there, um, which you got to use a little bit different strategy than I would use. Just, just from the bits that I could see through there, trying to analyze from a distance, I'm guessing that you don't have a, uh, that you, when you said you had trouble growing watermelon, that made me uh, think that you are dealing with some, uh, I'm looking at that slide right now of the row covers there. That soil to me looks pretty heavy. And maybe I'm misjudging it, but I'm, I'm guessing that you've got some, some, some deeper issues to deal with than I do, and that's going to cause you more uh, disease carryover. And when you have a sandy soil, and it's going to have you more, more problems with, with fungi and all kinds of things. So I did miss some of your slides when I was offline here for a while. But yeah, that soil looks a lot different than mine. So. Um, um, and besides the cover crops, we also use a composted turkey manure product that to me resembles dry grains. Mm -hmm. And is that even something like what you mean is a dry fertilizer? It's not the more fresh manure? Yeah, even I think. I don't, I don't know about that stuff. I, I guess I, I would, I would have to look at it. And I just think that there's something with, uh, with when you get into the vine crops, if you can get into something that's, that's active and, and living and decomposing there, you seem to do better with, with them growing. And that's just my little, tiny, not good scientific research that I've discovered. Uh, but I, I would not had a chance to experiment directly with that dry granulated turkey manure. If I get a chance to, I would love to put some side by side on some fresh soil that I'm bringing into production, just to compare, as I did back in the late '80s, early '90s, with you know commercial chemically prepared fertilizer to see if there is some difference. I mean, I love doing experiments like that, and I think that'd be something that would be interesting to see doing the same variety of squash. You know, I'll do a squash, a melon, and a watermelon on you know a row with uh, commercial fertilizer one on the jerky fertilizer and one on, you know, fresh or composted uh, fresh type manure and just compare them. I, I would like to do an experiment like that. It would be a little tricky with my organic certification. I'd have to go to the neighbors or someplace like that. So, but yeah, I would still like to do something like that to compare them. Yeah, I think that'd be interesting also to see. Well, this first question was kind of a joke a little bit, but I'm kind of curious that do cucumber beetles, can they be a natural pollinator as well? Uh, not to my knowledge because they're slick bodied and I don't know of any pollen and, and I can't, you know, I'm, I'm notorious for the fact and there was years I would spend between four and eight hours a day hand pollinating all the vine crops when I maintained all the stuff for seed savers. I still do a lot of pollination but nothing at that you know, ridiculous of a scale. And so I've been on my hands and knees, you know, from five in the morning until ten in the morning. Uh, those are about the prime receptive times for, for pollen on the vine crops to again taping the flowers shut at night from five to nine, you know, five till dark at night 
and I, 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 not that you haven't ever seen cucumber beetles in flowers, I don't ever have, not, don't think I've ever seen where they could carry pollen. I'm not saying they couldn't carry a trace of pollen on their bodies, but they don't have any, their bodies are so slick and hard that you don't see them moving a lot of pollen around. Uh, oh. Okay, and then I guess I've noticed, and I know it's a relative term, but a lot of native bees I've noticed at the farm, and I was even amazed to learn that there was a squash bee, that we have some of those that have come up at the farm the last few years, that I was surprised about. Um, then, you know, obviously plants not producing is a sign of poor pollination, but what would be some other indications that I've heard that something around a flower needs to be hit by a pollinator seven times for adequate pollination was one number I've heard. Mm -hmm. But what would be some signs like, uh, for instance, with some zucchini towards the end, they were starting to look like a bowling pin almost. So I was wondering yeah, if that would maybe be a sign of poor pollination and what would maybe be some other ones. Some signs of poor pollination would occur uh, with things like that where you get misshapen fruit because a lot of times, especially in uh, some of the squashes and particularly in cucumbers, you'll get pollination, or you'll get, excuse me, you'll get fruit set without any pollination at all. Um, and that, that you would notice when you cut them open and you have these fruits that are empty of seeds. I mean, even an overripe cucumber and you'll look at it and go, wow, and there's nothing in it. Um, if you're doing a large scale uh, vine crop grow out and you want to increase your yield, you're going to have to bring in some sort of a bee if, if you don't have any natural bee pollinators there. There are things other than honeybees you can bring in that will work, you know, um, mason bees and some of those that will, that will do quite a good job for you. But um, I know in my isolation plots last year, I did plant um, uh, some strips of buckwheat to, to see what the, the bee population was like. And buckwheat loves to attract um, attract bees. Uh, when I first grew buckwheat as cover crops 20 years ago, you'd go out there and it was just a buzz with bees. They were just thrilled with it. And then, you know, when my squash started blooming, they'd migrate to the squash. But um, this past summer, I had great hopes that I was going to harvest my buckwheat, some of it for uh, organic seed production. And there wasn't enough pollination. There were no bees there. So I don't, and I followed that up when I looked at my isolation plots. Very poor fruit set in these extremely healthy plants that I didn't, you know, and I knew it wasn't a situation of health, plant health because I went out and hand pollinated a bunch of the uh, squash because they were nice and easy and I got lots of fruit and the uh, musk melons and the cucumbers, which when you said seven, visit seven times with a cucumber and a musk melon, the average, the research that's been done that I've read, 20 to 25 times it needs to be visited in order to be pollinated. The pollen structures on cucumbers and musk melons, or the, excuse me, the receptive sites on the, on the female flowers are much lower, are deeper in the flower, and so that the, the little insect, uh, the bee or the squash, not the squash bee, but the, the solitary bees and things that will pollinate them need to penetrate down in there much, much, much more, and they carry less pollen. So you, you've got to have quite a few visits to get good melon and cucumber set, not quite as many to get fruit set for squash, but um, it, you can tell that by just looking at the plants themselves. If you take a look at a musk melon plant, it produces probably 40 to 50 male flowers for every female flower, and you get down to some of your squash, and some of those produce, you know, maybe five to six male flowers for every female flower. Um, and you can, you can look at the things like that, and it gives you a good indication when you get down at the ground level uh, and look at the, the plant itself. If it's got a tremendous amount of male flowers, you're going to, going to need a lot of pollinators in order for it to work right. Okay. Boy, wow, 20 to 25 times. That's amazing. That, um, well, at least right now, because of limited greenhouse space, um, I haven't been able to grow any cucurbit transplants at least to set out for production. Um, and you were talking about maybe some of the summer squash acting as a trap crop for winter squash, but uh, what would, would you think there'd be a benefit to planting a limited number of summer squash transplants just to set out as a tra trap crop oh, to help protect oh. other summer squash successions? Yes, I've done that in the past. When I, when I was going nuts in, in the early 90s trying to get this farm under control, I did that specifically. 
and you know set them out when I thought I don't care if they freeze or whatever they were just you know actually what works better if you want to use a trap crop and it's cheaper and it'll attract them even greater is bitter uh, ornamental gourds um, it, cucumber beetles are extremely attracted to little ornamental gourds if you know what I'm talking I'm not talking about the big lagenaria gourds the big green hard shell gourds I'm talking about the little cutesy ones that people put out at Thanksgiving time um, those those are excellent for attracting um, uh, cucumber beetles too. They they just are a little bit more bitter, and the cucumber beetles thrive on those. And you could plant a few of those transplants out, and boom, you know, spray those. And if you lose them, so be it. Uh, then your uh, good stuff is you know is protected. Great. I might actually try that last season after, or this season after last season. It was just amazing how many were out there cucumber beetles. Um, there was one season where I, pardon me? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, well, there was one season where I did try to grow watermelons and did not have much success, so I'm very envious of you. Sounds like with uh, with how, quote, unquote, <laughs> easily you can grow watermelons. Um, now, I had a, a problem with them. The side that was on the ground was rotting. Now, is this just, do you think because they were on bare ground and I didn't have a mulch that, or would there be some other reason? I'm not very familiar with uh, That's the thing that tripped me off when I saw that part, that you have probably fairly heavy soil because if the moisture doesn't drain away from them, watermelons, again, are a desert plant, and um, you, you want uh, them to be dry underneath. And I know when you're growing on a scale, when you're trying to do farmer's market and CSA type stuff, you can't go out there and put a little can or a piece of board under each one. Um, you kind of want to put your watermelons where the water's going to drain away from them. Um, try to um, do some heavy crop rotation. It sounds like you've got some pretty rich ground if you're getting a lot of rotting on them. Um, there can be other factors. I mean, if I could look at the plants, I could probably tell you right away whether you, you know, what your success thing is. You, you could have had some fungus. Um, anytime you have heavy soils, that's going to be the, the biggie, biggie there. Um, Varieties can play a big role on that too. You want some that are a little thicker skinned, ones that kind of harden up a little quicker than some of the, the nice little icebox type melons that people like to grow for, for CSAs. You're going to may have to get a little bit different type of melon and uh, you know I can I can help you out with that sometime you know when give me some ideas and maybe if I ever get over to your part of the state look at your soil and can probably tell you which types of watermelon would grow best and which ones you're going to struggle with. Sure, that'd be great. And even with the size of production we do, I did end up cutting egg cartons in half and putting them under each watermelon. Uh, the problem was the watermelons didn't stay on them, so they would roll off and then they would come off the vine. Then, so that didn't work out. But it was a it was a fun experiment and interesting to see the neighbors looking at me like a crazy guy. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, well, I realize every variety is different, but in general, what are some indicators for a ripe watermelon in the field that we've had discussions about it, and the only real solution we've come up with is to cut one open and try it? Okay, here's a, here's a key, and this comes from years of being on your hands and knees out there hand pollinating them, and, and I, well, the first thing I ever bred as a plant in plant breeding was I started working with watermelons when I was about 15, 16 years old where I lived in an area where you couldn't grow them, and I started keeping good notes, and that's probably been uh, the key. One of the general rules of thumb is, and this works for Iowa for me, is about the time, from the time that they set fruit, uh, and they have a normal summer, we're not, we're not talking about some abnormally cool year, uh, about 38 days after they set fruit, they usually, you will have your first indications of ripeness. Now that's for Iowa. I'm not talking about upstate New York or places where it could be cooler or whatever. Um, but the other, the, the easiest thing to do is, is to look, your watermelon when it's ripe gets a dull color to it. Know what your watermelons look like as they're growing and they'll be bright and shiny and then all of a sudden they'll get a little bit dull. That's one way to look. The other thing is to go right behind the stem that's, a, uh, that's attached to the vine where the watermelon's at and there'll be a little tendril back there. And when that little tendril dries and don't rush it and it's, you know, by picking at it every day until it, falls off, but as it dries, your melon will be ripe. When that tendril's dry and the bottom of your melon usually will change color too. Most melons start out as kind of pale yellow or, or white on the bottom side and as they ripen they'll turn a more orangish color. 
Some other indicators that when they're getting too ripe is you'll see, especially on the dark-skinned melons like the black diamond, Texas giant types, on the top side you will see almost kind of like a little bit of netting going, a little bit of scarring going, and then at that point in time it uh, is going to be too, uh, too ripe. Um, rule of thumb is I'd say the 38 days works pretty good and just don't get too antsy, but look for that tendril. That's the best, um, best, thing, to, uh, best thing to look at. Well, it's kind of the same idea with winter squash, too, that I know that all the different varieties are different. And that's something that I've heard with winter squash as a kind of a general indicator to tell if it's ripe, is that tendril opposite the fruit will be shriveled. Um, what other... And they get, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, and they get duller, too. I mean, you take, uh, you take a... I'll just use a green... One of those kabochas that you grow. Uh, sure. they're, they're a bright, beautiful green, and then all of a sudden they get kind of dull. And when they get dull, that's a good indication. Acorns are easiest to tell when they're ripe because they get a, an orangish spot on the bottom and that you know that wasn't there before. Um, the um, I use the fingernail test. Um, I used to, I guess, when I was learning. Now it's become so routine for me. I can just walk out through and go, "This squash is ripe. This one isn't." And and I need to, um, you know, so that for when I'm helping people, have my the student helpers that I have tell me, well, how am I doing that? And look for those subtle things. But mainly you look for that color change and, and this, this, the stem itself starts to kind of, um, oh, uh, deteriorate some around where it attaches to the to the vine. I mean, I don't want to say deteriorate. That's not a good word, but it just... Is that kind of like the corky? Yeah, is yeah, that like a cork? Just... Right. And and what is the fingernail test? This is new to me. <laughs> fingernail test is what I learned 40 years ago. Is you put your fingernail in in the winter squash in the in the shell and the, the rind, and if it looks if it goes in very easily, it's not mature. If it you put your fingernail there and it doesn't leave much of a mark, not much of a dent, but just kind of a faint crease. Then your your fruit is probably ripe. If you pick most squash, and I mean you just in, in science you learn that there's never such a thing as all or none. But if you pick most winter squash, they will not ripen off the vine to any quality. There are many exceptions in the Moschata species, where I there's several that I grow that you pick them fine when they're green. They're, they're some of the butternut types, and they will ripen. Uh, eight months later, and they'll be just as fine. In fact, better flavored than than picked fresh if they'd ripen in that. Um, you know, it you've got to be careful with that fingernail test. You don't go nuts and just poke it all over the place. You know, it's best on the maximus for me. I think is to look at the at that stem gets corky and kind of dries. It's not slick and smooth anymore. It just gets kind of kind of a crumbly look to the outside of it. And uh, doing this presentation has caused me to realize next summer I need to take some good photos because I could show you a photo of, a, of different stages of ripeness of stems right there and it would be really clear cut because it's really obvious if you could look at those pictures. So, you know, I'm, um, I'm guilty of not being a good photo person, but I, I will, I promise to do better and, and if somehow maybe I can send them to Luke and he can put them online for people next fall because it, that's a really easy one to tell when, you, when you've got the the pictures you could look at it and, and it'd be just like a keying out something in a scientific key because it's really obvious once you get the hang of it. That would be great. Last season I uh, was using different seed catalog pictures to judge the ripeness of spaghetti squash and where the pictures mm. are different and every one and I just and some that looked very ripe to me weren't ripe and yes. some that looked very pale yellow were ripe so yes. that was a shock to me. Hmm. Uh, one person out here says, this scratch just ruins more squash like people pinching sweet corn kernels for juiciness. I, I agree. Uh, you got to know what you're doing. I mean, if you've got everybody coming up to you at the market and, and putting their fingernails in your squash, you're going to have to get rid of those really quick because they're not going to keep very well, uh, you know, if they're not mature. If they're really, truly mature, you're not going to do too much damage to most of them. But if they're not mature, it's, it's detrimental to the squash. Right. Sure. Well, that was the last question I had for you. I didn't know if, if Luke, do you want to, is there time for people to ask questions?
Sure, you know, I promised a few minutes, so let's uh, let's take an extra 10 minutes for questions from the audience. Wow, Randy Waterman's asking, is cow manure or poultry manure better? Um, wow, Randy, what a tough question, and I know who you are, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I usually have poultry manure. Um, last year, one of my former students was trying to get rid of some cow manure, and I started my, my field that had been uh, in uh, hay for many years. We spread cow manure on it. It did fabulous. I, I, I can't say that there's... Uh, the way he de dealt with his cattle, though, I had lots of uh, hay matter in it and stuff, too. So I think, I think both are great. I've used sheep manure because I have sheep. I've used a little bit of my hog manure, but I don't have that many hogs that I get that much. So, um, you know, those are, those are great. Um, I think the next question, if I'm reading this right, is I have trouble with mice, bull, and ground squirrels. Any ideas? I also do a whole bunch of sweet potatoes and uh, voles love those so they've ditched my squash and don't bother me on the squash anymore and they go right to the sweet potatoes. Ground squirrels will, is one of the reasons I switched to setting up transplants for a few years because they would go around and find all my seeds and just go right down the row and eat everything up. Um, uh, Uh, what was I going to say here? Um, mice voles are tough to get rid of. Uh, when I find out the answer for that, I promise I'll tell the world because they have given me fits. So. There was one back up here that I wanted to answer earlier that said have been using ground cherries as a trap crop for potato beetles. Those are great for that. I have wild ground cherries here. There is a native perennial that attracts squash bugs. It's called the buffalo gourd, uh, but sprays over the years have pretty much made it an extinct species. When I did my grad, uh, grad work, my advisor and I went all around and you still can't, it's very difficult to find it anymore. Um, I have seed. I've, I've lost it a couple times. Uh, it, it doesn't winter over too well around here. Um, oh, planting ground. Yeah, if you can get the seeds right before the ground squirrels, that's that's a good idea. If you know how to keep, if you can time yourself for planting just before rain. Definitely. Ground squirrels like nice, dry, loose dirt, and they will go right down a row. They can smell that seed, and they can find it even if they, they seem to know the spacings of a planter. They know in hills. In hills, they love it because you've got them. If you use a planter, I found them and watched them go right down the row practically after I was done and just eat every seed. They'd go down every four to six inches, however far the planter would plant the seeds apart, and gobble every seed up. So ground squirrels can be a real nightmare. And then they, if you get them in the mud, I think that the mud helps control the smell more so that then the seed gets a chance to germinate. But I've also then, as soon as they start germinating, the ground squirrels will come along and dig up the plants and eat, and eat the seed that's, that they can find. Mm. Um. I have not, by Indian, are we talking Indian from India or are we talking Indian from Native America? Uh, Native American varieties are more resistant because they were grown here with the pests. So yes, we have some squash like a Ricker and Mandan and some of the native types that are very, very tolerant to uh, insect pests. Uh, that Tinda gourd, I just experimented with that last year and, and stumbled onto that. Okay, Lufa. Yeah, lufa, snake gourd, bitter melon, um, those all seem to be more tolerant to, um, to our pest situation here. 
Uh, I don't have any troubles with any of those. Uh, bitter melons, the biggest problem I have is the voles get in and eat the, the fruit if I don't have it trellised, because they like them. We'll still accept questions for another five minutes, but I wanted to uh, have everybody just quick shoot, shoot me your email in the chat box, and I'll be sure to send a survey link out so we can capture uh, uh, your feedback on how we did tonight. Uh, there's still another five minutes for questions, and uh, please do put them in the chat box. Thank you much. I don't know about uh, you all, but I think that uh, this was a wonderful farminar, and uh, I wish we could have you guys on once a month. I mean that. <laughs> this is really, really, really good. Yeah, thanks a lot for doing this, Glenn. I've learned quite a bit tonight. Oh, oh sure. I might have been a little bit better prepared for this. I tried getting out of it as Bruce knows by saying I don't know the technology very well, and. Uh, I will try to get some pictures next summer and get them on the website so people can do some things like that because that's pretty easy information if you can look at a picture. It's kind of hard to read a description and go, oh yes, you know, it's when it's quirky, well what does that mean? And I, I know how to do it and I've got a, I've got a young student who's an excellent photographer and, and I'll give her a little extra cash to come and take some photos and we'll put together something that maybe if, if PFI can put it on the website and it can help folks, that would be great. So. Yeah, I understand about the using manure, uh, shredded leaves, fertilizer, that's great. That's why I gave two methods, the cover crop method and the manure method. Um, I have um, I have all kinds of poultry. I need to find a way for the manure to get out there, but I also didn't have enough poultry to do it all, so that's why I started the cover, cover, uh, cover crop method. Uh, where am I located in eastern Iowa? Um, I'm 25 miles northwest of Davenport in a little town called Calamus on Highway 30 in Clinton County. Oh, we have tons of bull snakes. They're my best. Um, I encourage them considerably because they have the refuge of the 17 acres of my hillside. They, they nest here. They raise their young here. Uh, they have done wonders for my gopher population. Uh, they help me with my rat population and my poultry, and they do do a wonderful job in the garden catching as many voles as they can. They do scare the willies out of some of my helpers and my wife, <laughs> and every once in a while they shock me. But we've had bull snakes up to, oh, I think the largest one was eight and a half feet long once. Uh, she lived here for a number of years. Um, I haven't seen her the last couple of years. So. That's an interesting comment. I think I would. I think I understand. That's where I, I think I understand what you're talking about there with the fungi of the leaf biology of leaf mold, uh, because that's where I think the decomposing organic matter in the soil is is more important from that aspect from rotting leaves and vegetation. Tree seedlings. I don't understand that question. I'm sorry. We're in the final minute. I wanted to give one more uh, uh, thank you to the speakers and also encourage everybody to come to join us next week, every Tuesday in March through the first week of April, for our Spring Farminar series. 
more information on our website, www.practicalfarmers.org slash farm and arts. Thank you, and I think uh, that was our last question. Unless, uh, Glenn, do you see any others? I don't see any at this point. Dad. Kathy Rose is trying to get back to me, but if she wants to email me, I'll, I'll try to answer her question. So. Oh, tree seedlings float in. Oh, okay. Um, why? I'm not sure how you would control that. Um, I have a lot of maples that come up, silver maples, but... That's fun. Sandburrs, easiest way to control is get your fertility up. They like poor soil. You know, get your fertility up and learn to cultivate. Sometimes you may not leave an area fallow. I did that for one year and just tilled them up during every time that they would get. Boy, I got rid of them all. And that works great to get rid of because they are something else. This farm was 40 acres of sandburrs. So it, you, you have to work at it. But I, I found one plant last summer in the whole place. It was the far end of a field. Yes. Aaron Daniel. All right, folks. I'm so sorry. <clears throat> Excuse me. So sorry to have to cut this discussion uh, off, uh, but we do have to let our speakers rest and uh, have a good evening. And I wish everyone uh, safe driving on the way home. Right? Just kidding. We're already yeah. home. Yeah. Okay, thank you.